Hey, Cody. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you? Honest. Good. How are you, sir? Doing great. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much. Uh, you are so far in this uh, podcast series, the first open source founder building for healthcare. And so I'm super excited to hear about your background and how Medbloom got started. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for talking about Medplum. We're super excited about it. Um, yeah, Medplum. Um, I've been in our, the Medplum team has been in the healthcare tech industry for like 15 years now. Um, and I think that's given us an opportunity to really uh, work with a lot of different healthcare organizations, understand a lot of the problems that our partners and our customers face. Healthcare in the United States is a very complicated space, lots of regulatory requirements and security requirements, um, interoperability requirements. And I think that's given us um, a good kind of bird's eye view of all the different uh, challenges that people face. Um, I think that in general in healthcare or in tech, people are very spoiled. Like there's lots of great open source libraries out there to make new applications fast and quick and easy. And that a lot of times doesn't apply to healthcare. Um, for example, you can't go use uh, Vercel um, with a healthcare application because they're not HIPAA compliant. And so uh, you just, it, it creates an interesting space for us. Absolutely. Huge gap in the market. And it sounds like you're the right team to be building this platform. <laughs> and so, you know, congratulations for this huge undertaking. Uh, what did the early days look like? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, maybe just a little bit of backstory, um, which will give some context. Um, our first experience with healthcare was almost 15 years ago, where we were doing um, something called teleradiology. And we were based in Asia at the time. And at that time, it was kind of more of the wild, wild west when it comes to cloud and healthcare. But the idea was in the United States, nighttime radiology is very expensive. And so you could have American radiologists living in Asia. So it's daytime there when it's nighttime in the United States. You would digitize these radiology exams, send it over the internet. They would look at the images, make the report, and send it back. Um, but it's nighttime ER work, and so the turnaround time was expected to be twenty to thirty minutes. And so if you have a data set that's uh, of hundreds of megabytes or gigabyte in size, you need to transmit it to Asia, where your internet and bandwidth might not be the most reliable. You need to then you know view it and then send it all back. It was quite a complex process, which was good because it was real trial by fire for healthcare tech and healthcare interoperability. Um, we've been, the same team has kind of gone through a few different products in, in the radiology space and then in lab testing space and in, in general, um, um, like general medicine. And so through that process, we've accumulated a healthy network, which is, I think, always really helpful for any startup, right? Um, having lots of connections and people in the space who you can um, lean on for like beta testing or a sounding board is critical. Um, so then the earliest of days, it was mostly just with other healthcare startups that were our friends. And that was before we had fully committed to the idea of like, oh, this is a startup. This is a business. At that point, it was more of a, we have friends who are doing some interesting healthcare work. They need a place to store data. We know how to do it securely and compliantly. So we'll just help them out. And I think that goes a long way to one, building goodwill with your early customers and your early partners, and two, validating that there is a reproducible need that like, you know, three or four different groups might need something that has a similar shape. You don't want to be, I think this is always a real fear and concern for, for open source companies or, or startup companies in general, that you end up being a dev shop or, or a professional services organization, that all, all you are is just doing contract development work, and there's nothing that's going to be reproducible and sit at the center. And so I think that was a big part of the initial first year or so was just validating that hypothesis that there was enough of a kind of common platform that we could use with all partners. Um, I love that. And, and was, that, kind of, was that open source from, from day one when working with these uh, teams? No, it, it, it was um, not day one. Uh, the, the, the initial days, I mean, when you're doing your initial um, cowboy coding phase of things of like the V0 of a project, um, I think that doing it with the open source polish would be intimidating. Um, but I think very early on, the be beginning of 2021, and uh, it's been open source since that time. and um, 
which is also somewhat intimidating. I think some customers love the fact that it's open source and that they have that much visibility into the process. And there's others who are scared of it. And they're like, wait, does that make it less secure? Or does that, can hackers use this against us? And so th there's been some interesting conversations to try to mitigate those concerns over time. But um, uh, no, it's been, so it's been open source for the past two years um, in the production setting for that time and more, um, and, which is, and it's going great. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. And six months ago, you had, uh, you launched on Hacker News, right? And the reception there was real big. Would you like to talk about this? Yeah. So we, um, thank you. Uh, we went through Y Combinator as part of the summer 22 batch and um, it's, and then the YAC partners are very adamant. You need to get out there and launch. And I think that all, all startups, especially software engineers, are maybe oftentimes a little bit um, timid about, you know, launching on Hacker News. It's it's a, a very um, opinionated audience and they have um, lots of thoughts and feelings about how things should be done. And so I think that we wanted to really make sure that the house was clean, the table was set, that we were ready for the, a very harsh and, and critical audience to kind of come in and, and, and judge our product. Um, but the launch went great. Um, it, it was, it was, the community was very receptive to it. I think that there were a lot of people from healthcare who understood the need and the opportunity immediately. A lot of people who aren't in healthcare, who had a kind of like, why doesn't this exist already? Like, you know, which is, I think a very reasonable response. Um, so overall it, it was great. And, um, it's also great from a business development perspective. It's a chance to, um, kind of debut to a, an audience of potential customers and get their eyeballs, get their feedback and start those conversations. That's, that's phenomenal. And ever since then, are there some, uh, you know, maybe highlights you might like to share in terms of usage, contributors, the community? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and in a way, um, I, I think that some of our, our GitHub numbers, I, I think that people would look at it and think, oh, those are rookie numbers, right? Like if you compare yourself to something like, React with like what is it twenty thousand stars? It's a very high bar. But if you just stay focused on the healthcare open source ecosystem, um, it, it's been a, a very fast rise, and we're now in the top three or so um, projects in m m many healthcare categories, which has been like very satisfying and rewarding. Um, we have some very significant customers today, um, including uh, Roe or Roman Health, um, which is a very large um, at-home lab testing company, um, uh, 30 Madison, which is, uh, they have a, a number of different brands, including Nurex, which is one of the largest um, online birth control distributors in the United States. And so these are significant operations with hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of patients, and that they've trusted MedPlum as one of their primary um, you know, components in their tech stack is, is, it feels very rewarding. So, and that, those are just the large ones. Then there's also a very uh, uh, vibrant ecosystem of early stage companies that are building completely new digital healthcare experiences, both in the United States and internationally. Um, and in some cases, in many cases, we don't have a commercial relationship with them. They're just using the project and we only hear about it because they ask a question in Discord. And um, I think that as a team, we like are strong believers in the open source ethos. And that that is awesome. You know, it feels great that the project can start to take on a life of its own and, and even um, without a commercial relationship that people can find value in the project and it, it's helping them to do new and innovative things in healthcare. It, it makes us, it's, it's so satisfying. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing this. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that you're trying to become the standard in the industry for people building uh, healthcare applications, right? Uh, yeah. That's the, <laughs> that's the plan over here. And how are you managing all this growth and uh, in terms of the team, and uh, yeah, hiring plans, funding uh, that you secured, if you'd like to talk about these things. Yeah, um, good question. So when we started, there was the three founders um, who and the, we've known each other for a long time and working together for a long time. Um, we did raise um, a, a seed round uh, in 2022, so last year, and that's enabled the growth. The team is now six. We've hired some um, really talented software engineers, people that we've worked with in the past, who um, I think is it's, it's just critical in the early days, you know, going to your personal network. So um, 
I think anytime you hire an engineer, there's always two questions. One, can they actually do the job? And two, can you work well with them, right? Because um, personal dynamics and and uh, interpersonal conflict can, can kill a startup. So going to folks that we've worked with in the past, and we know that they're like top tier engineers and they're great team players was was really important to us. Um, and thankfully that's happened. So the team is now six, uh, which has really uh, increased our overall capacity to serve our customers. I, um, I think some, there's like a spectrum in open source land, right, of things that are... Uh, you just kind of give the code away and you hope that people are going to use it and you may have uh, very loose relationships with all your users. And then there's the other end, which is more enterprisey, which is where we're at, where when someone engages with us, like we're all in with them and we're going to have weekly meetings and shared Slack channels and we're going to do um, training, on-site training and, and lots of guidance on architecture and deployment. Um, so those big deployments are are somewhat heavy lift, but we think it's also very important because especially for our first however many customers, we want to make sure that they have an amazing experience, right? That like that they are not only did it solve their problem, but like they loved the process, which people don't usually think of with software engineering, right? Like, oh, I love that library. But that that's that's our goal that they it's so delightful to them that, and it, they feel like they were able to jump forward in terms of um, months uh, like uh, of of unnecessary development that we just cut out and they allowed them to launch faster or opened up new capabilities. And so therefore we think it's really important to work really closely with those initial customers, which is hard, um, but it, I, it, I think it's, it's very worth it. Um, and then after that, you know, for the, the broader ecosystem, it's been an interesting education. We're trying to follow the kind of best practices playbook of other open source projects with a Discord community and um, trying to en engage our users there, taking lots of feedback. And um, we're, we don't have crazy numbers and contributors. I think that we're at 30 today. Um, and every single one of them is very satisfying and it, it's hugely rewarding. Um, Sometimes it ranges from, you know, cleaning up some docs and sometimes it's, wow, they really rolled up their sleeves and they're deep in the weeds on this database connection, blah, blah, blah. Um, and whenever like someone really goes crazy like that, uh, that that's the best because um, to me, it, it signals the future of what's possible of, you know, more um, meaningful and impactful contributions at, at a very deep and fundamental level. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you know, building applications and templates that other people could use uh, to fast, uh, fast track their own development. Absolutely. To support the sustainability of the project and have the capacity to invest in these relationships uh, with your customers and service them. Uh, is there something we could say here about how you approach uh, monetization and other founders, you know, with similar markets in a similar stage, how they could navigate it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um... So for our largest customers, and, and we have, uh, this is actually quite rare in, in healthcare technology, Al almost every healthcare tech product today, if you go to their website and you, you, you're, you have this question in your mind of like, how much is this going to cost? And almost nobody will tell you, right? It's always contact sales, mm -hmm. schedule a demo. And yes. there's this feeling of like a kind of sleazy process that it's going to be a whole bunch of, of salespeople jumping on a meeting and they're, and, and we, we want to avoid that. So we have publicly available pricing, um, which uh, for, there's like a very basic tier. If you are, first of all, people can use the product for free. And if you want to get some basic level support, it starts at $300 per month. The, the publicly listed pricing goes up to, I think, about $2,000 per month. And then we have additional plans that go beyond that. And that really depends on what level of support or custom feature development or, um, I guess, what kind of quirky configuration or deployment process do you have that, that will require our time and energy? And it kind of goes up from there. Um, I think that there's an interesting dynamic in the United States healthcare system where um, early players, they, they're kind of their overall revenue and willingness to spend money starts relatively low. But then if you kind of just follow the line of like, as organizations grow, it stays low. And then at the very late stage, the numbers get wildly outrageously large. And like, if you think about, so I live in San Francisco, the largest hospital system here is you see SF, the University of California, San Francisco, and their primary 
healthcare platform is Epic, which is the most commonly used platform for most hospitals. And this is publicly inf information, but they spent about $700 million on their Epic deployment. And that's a lot of money. And I, and I don't know over what period of time that applies to, but um, there are many large hospital systems that spend that much money. So you have this like long, shallow curve. And then at the late stage, people spend massive amounts of money. And, you know, we, we're, we're very early. Um, we're not eligible for contracts like that. We won't be for a number of years, but that we need to kind of go through this process, eat our vegetables, develop our reputation, build out our capabilities, build out our ecosystem that like over time that we could target opportunities like that um, is a really exciting idea. And there, there hasn't been, in my opinion, there hasn't been enough people challenging that status quo um and if you think about it it makes sense it's a it's a gauntlet it's going to take decades to like get to that level but um perhaps naively like we we're going to make a run for it we're going to try um and so it's just a matter of like how do we continue to kind of grow move up the ladder move up the sophistication move up the size of our clients and customers and capabilities absolutely absolutely wow that's uh that sounds exactly right that's that's phenomenal and as the pool from the market and from different niches of the market of the different size increases um how do you go about you know maybe prioritizing which conversations you should have which customers you should work with more closely this can be challenging right um uh, it's very challenging you're absolutely right and you often have these um kind of competing goals. Um, and so we're coming at it from a few different angles. And so I'll, I'll very transparently kind of share how we think about this. Um, the, the most immediate goals that we have are, you know, we, we want to have healthy revenue and like, a, a, you know, a viable business. So revenue is good. And so if there's an opportunity that's going to like generate revenue, let's, let's do it. Um, we also are kind of going through the the venture playbook. And so, you know, we, we raised a seed round. We have our eyes on what are the kind of milestones and metrics that we would want for raising an A and raising a B. And what does that like overall curve look like? What does that path look like? And in our mind, there's there's certain milestones and, and key capabilities that we want to make sure that we have in the platform because they tell the story about that kind of ongoing curve. And so certain examples... Um, are getting access to certain payer networks. And so being able to take or receive payments from Medicare and Medicaid, you know, there, there's a process and, and you have to, it's not just a technical limitation. There's a number of legal and compliance and bureaucratic challenges that you have to go through. Um, same with ordering medications or ordering controlled substances or, or all these various like things that you are, will, we will have to do eventually to tell that story. And so then there's, now, this strategic element, when we're talking to potential customers of, you know, if they're paying revenue, that's great, but maybe they're not going to be that strong on revenue, but they're going to be a kind of design partner for getting access to this new capability. And we have like a list of 10 or so key capabilities, like tent post capabilities that we really want to be able to demonstrate. And so we're very happy to work with customers on a strategic basis because, you know, we can help them solve their problems and they can help kind of sponsor the development of these, these necessary milestones. Um, and so we, we have a lot of internal conversations just trying to navigate and, and find balance between those two, two goals. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing this. Actually, this makes a lot of sense. And so both the roadmap and the relationships and where you focus, they all go hand in hand and you optimize for you know getting revenue and then satisfying some of those use cases that you know need to be prevalent. Uh, that's 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 excellent. Is there something we could uh, share with other founders who you know hope to build uh, in the space of healthcare in terms of uh, the adoption of, of products, in terms of, you know, uh, this is for developers, right? But there are big organizations and maybe those developers are not decision makers. And so how do you approach this, right? It could be amazing. Um, yeah, no, it, it, this is a great, great question and a great topic um, and a very complicated one. Um, first, I'll, I'll make a, a few distinctions that I think are important distinctions to make. Um, one is that we serve the the provider side. So um in particular organizations that are going to have their own doctors or working with doctors. Um, there is a separate 
like a category of, of products which are really going after patients directly. And so it's usually our customers are going after patients, but they have their own doctors or some kind of medical provider on staff. Um, going after patients directly is a very difficult business because uh, the cost of customer acquisition is very high because you're typically competing with you know, pharma and uh, like large consumer brands that have they're just going to outspend you. And you it is really difficult unless you're doing something very, very clever, very, very innovative. It's very difficult to, to acquire customers in that space versus like working with doctors and working with healthcare providers. Um, I think that that's a more manageable um, and there's just a, a much larger market there. Um, and, and they have more reasonable expectations. Um, and you can go through a more of a traditional B2B sales process with those groups. And so I, I think that that's a, just a generally easier market to pursue. So I'll, I'll start there. Now, with regards to like, how do you approach these folks and, or what, what kind of, I think that there's a few different strategies. I think, um, I, I think that from a, if you're a first time entrepreneur or you're just getting started, like being willing to roll up your sleeves and do custom development for organizations is a great way to just get your foot in the door. Um, a lot of times there, there are a lot of, individuals in the healthcare system, doctors and administrators and all kinds of care providers. They have lots of ideas about how they could create a better experience for patients or create a more efficient system for delivering healthcare, um, but they don't have a team of software engineers or they don't have budget. And so I think partnering with them and helping build prototypes, build proof of concepts, build the ones, um, goes a long, long ways to, um, for you as the entrepreneur to like learn about the space, learn about the opportunity, but then in terms of that relationship, building goodwill and getting access and just like learning. Um, when I think about my first two or three years in healthcare, I sat in a room with radiologists like daily, just like watching how they use the software. And Doctors like they love to complain about software. They'll 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 just like complain, complain, and, which is great because that's like you're you're getting the most direct feedback about like what do they want and what makes them angry, what makes them happy. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a doctor be like, "Do you believe this? Watch how many times I have to click one, two, three. And they're just like they're going through and they're just like they're angry because the product was never really optimized for them. And you know I. I if you think about something like Gmail and if it took 20 clicks to like compose a new email, yeah, I'd be angry. And like, that's how they feel about the tools that they use every day. And so I think just getting access to the providers, getting access to the doctors and being part of that conversation. So you can hear their thought process. You can hear um, like what they want, what they like, what they don't like. And, and, you know, there's the Henry Ford thing of like, if you ask customers what they want, they would have asked for a mechanical horse, but they really wanted a car. And so I think that you as an entrepreneur and you as the engineer, you have to kind of apply a bit of a lens and a filter to you know what they're saying and then translating that into something that's achievable or realistic or something that's possible to build. Um, but before any of that, like just getting part of that conversation is it, it, so necessary and so important. And the vast majority of people in the healthcare system, they have thoughts, they have ideas, and they want to talk to tech people about like how they could go about it. And so I think uh, just kind of rolling up your sleeves, getting through the awkward conversations and, and, and talking to those folks is, is very, very valuable. And you can learn a lot very fast. Thank you so much for highlighting this. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, circling back on what you said earlier about, you know, a lot of folks that try to go generic and not build too close or custom relationships because then oh we become a dev shop whatever but actually like in in that space is when you are uncover things you didn't know and there is opportunity yeah. so thanks for highlighting that and uh for a market like this that you operate in as well is there any prediction you could make uh you know for, for the end of this decade about how things will evolve in your space uh that's a really good question um predictions so i think that there's a few trends that have been consistent now for a while mm -hmm. um so one it, like when we were getting started 10 15 years ago um cloud was a dirty word um people at that time did not really believe in healthcare data in the cloud and they wanted everything in legacy servers on prem like physical security in healthcare they often talk about the castle and moat model where the the, the idea was 
we have too much software running inside the hospital. We can't secure everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to physically secure the building. And so everything inside the building is it's kind of a free for all. But we're going to put a moat of like VPNs and air gaps and restricted networks, et cetera. And so everything, you know, we're hip compliant inside the castle, but no, no one's getting in or out. And that model broke down pretty badly when there was a lot of consolidation. So hospitals are buying other hospitals and now they need to, to integrate with each other. Doctors want to bring their iPhone into the hospital and they want to be able to look at patient data on their iPhone when you can't do that unless everything's on the same network. And so that, that went through a really large transformation over the last 10 or so years. And I think we're still early in that. There's, there's still a lot of software that is very legacy servers on-prem, it's in a rack in the closet, in the basement, and there's a lot of benefits to moving things towards cloud. And if anything, the, the story has flipped so hard that now the story is we don't trust people's local devices. We only want cloud because if it's on their laptop and their laptop gets stolen, now that's a that's a, that's a breach and we have to report it and da-da-da. Versus if everything is very cloud centric and a device is gone, fine. We'll just like, you know, kill the accounts and that device is utterly useless. So um, so I think it, it feels weird to say cloud is a trend because like for, for outside of healthcare, cloud is kind of like, we, we, that's a foregone conclusion. But I think it is still, there's still a lot of opportunity there. Um, interoperability, the US government is, um, has made a lot of very smart moves about pushing healthcare interoperability and healthcare data standards in an effort of improving interoperability and in improving uh, kind of data uh, portability, so to speak. So the, for example, uh, imagine you went to, uh, this happened to me once, I was on a skiing trip and I had a knee injury and I got an MRI at, at the ski facility. And then I went back home and they're like, well, you need to get another MRI because we can't get access to your first one. And so, okay, um, it, it's just, it feels like waste, right? It, it's it's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my money. And it's a waste of resources. And that was largely because um, that this data portability and data interoperability didn't exist. And the U.S. government recognized this, that it's like a massive amount of waste and it's just inefficiency. So this data portability is kind of pursuing this further. Um, and we're still early in that. Um they're not only at the kind of technical level, but also in the incentives level that mm -hmm. there's now financial incentives for being able to share more data to reduce the amount of duplicated tests and duplicated scans, et cetera, et cetera. So there's still a lot of opportunity just enabling that um, the data standardization, data interoperability. Um, I put security in that camp as well. The U.S. government is just getting more and more sophisticated about their security requirements, and that creates a lot of you know opportunities to help organizations um, just get buttoned up and compliant on all the security requirements. And then, you know, this all uh, chat GPT and AI, you know, there's been a lot of talk about being in healthcare for a long time. And I think that doctors have had a pretty natural skepticism um, for machine learning in healthcare. Um, I think that the, the situation is changing and, so first, before we have some kind of super intelligent uh, intelligence, even if you just had traditional machine learning techniques, there's a lot of opportunity. I think most of the skepticism comes for a diagnostic purpose, right? The idea of, oh, you're going to, a patient will walk in and a robot will diagnose them and order meds, order tests. I, I don't think that's realistic in the short term, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff in healthcare that is very automatable, such as patients um, sending in messages about questions about billing, questions about insurance. I need to reschedule this appointment. Oh, I need to update my uh, medical history. Those things are not diagnostic. They're not clinical. There's no medical decision-making, but there's a massive amount of human cost that goes into just all of that like support logistics to keep a hospital running, to keep a doctor's office running. And every single one of those is an opportunity to apply machine learning or to apply like automation to make things easier. Um, I worked with One Medical, which is one of the largest uh, primary care providers in the United States. And the machine learning team there, like the some of the biggest wins were um, parsing faxes. There's still a massive amount of just paperwork that's going across the wire because there's not interoperability. So just um, 
being able to look at a fax and identifying which patient this is for, like this is like a kind of trivial machine learning exercise, hugely valuable though, because that's a lot of time and energy and it's an error prone process when, when manu humans are doing it manually. So very, very simple thing. And I think that we're still early days of applying machine learning at that level. And then, okay, now chat GPT and more sophisticated language models are coming around and it creates all kinds of new opportunities. And I wouldn't be so brave to predict what that will look like, but I think it's an easy uh, prediction to say it will look like something. There's opportunity there. Um, when we're spending so much money on healthcare, doctors are so burned out with dealing with the um, administrative workload of healthcare. They just want to practice good medicine. You know, they spent years of their life going to med school. They they have all this amazing intelligence. They don't want to waste a bunch of time dealing with scheduling hurdles. Like they they want to do good medicine. And I think that there's an opportunity for a lot more um, automation in that space. Amazing. Thank you so much for all these insights. And so the, the mega trends that people can expect, uh, you know, you said is moving from no cloud on premise to cloud interoperability, data standards, portability, and then AI. Uh, quick note, because I know it can be a you know massive topic to discuss, but even before going to the machine learning applications over this you know portable available data, you know even steps before that, for medical researchers, uh, what can they expect or hope for in terms of how available data will be um, and you know how things will change in the terms of publications and. Great question. And some like really interesting movements there. Um, the, the historical way was, well, it, the historical way was very, very tiny data sets. And so there's lots of papers that get published or research projects that are conducted where they're looking at population sizes of like 50 to 100 patients. It's, it's, it's uh, like tragically small because it was so difficult to get access to data or to to do meaningful partnerships where you can get more more data. So um, a couple trends there. One is on better anonymization frameworks mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, work with groups, get like uh, filtered data. Um, anonymization in healthcare is a very tricky topic because uh, to, to very safely and robustly anonymize data is, is a hard problem. And this is potentially another application for machine learning or, um, but just the act of anonymizing it. And it, it's, um, it does not take too many data elements to uniquely identify an individual. And that's what makes the data anonymization process so hard, um, especially when you include something like a job title and a zip code. Um, the, the, like you can very quickly winnow that down to a single individual with just those two data elements. And you have like, you know, all of the other elements, uh, the obvious ones of name, date of birth, like those are gone, but just zip code and, and job title. Sometimes there's only one director of healthcare services in a certain zip code. And like, that's an individual. So that that's a hard problem, but there's tooling that's getting better. So maybe the kind of next evolution from anonymization is the synthetic data in healthcare. So this is the process of, looking at a, a, a real production live data set and using statistical methods and other kind of algorithmic processing to generate a derivative data set that has the exact same shape and characteristics of the original data set in terms of healthcare outcomes and you know age and basic patient demographics um, like gender and age but also like height weight um, and healthcare outcomes what tests have been performed all, all, all the different healthcare metrics that they can generate that synthetic data set. Um, there's some early players in that space and that are doing well. I think there's still a lot more opportunity um, to kind of move up in sophistication and the statistical accuracy of those synthetic data sets. And, there's, and that will be massive for these clinical researchers. Um, if you can have some kind of statistical guarantee that the data is representative, but you can get access and now you have not a population of 50 patients, but a population of 50,000 patients, it's a, just a much more meaningful way to, to do various um initial like early early research that can graduate into like actual patients that's very very interesting uh very interesting thank you for sharing this and is there today i know we're approaching towards the end just uh, one quick last question is there someone in this space that you so far have uh, you know maybe looked out to for advice or you know if it's not would you be open to like other founders contacting you to <laughs> you know learn some things yeah i i i think that 
um, as part of the Silicon Valley ethos, I think that in general, we always want to um, help those who are coming. I, we, we've received a ton of help over our time in Silicon Valley. Like the startup ecosystem here is amazing. And I think that's one of the real strengths of Silicon Valley that people are always willing to reach out and, and talk and, and to help. Um, I think for people who are explicitly interested in healthcare, there are a number of organizations out there that are specifically focused on helping launch new healthcare startups. Um, Rock Health, uh, Startup Health. Um, there's an emerging trend of uh, like venture studios. So not just venture capitals, uh, venture capital, but also uh, venture studios. So they provide not only funding, but also resources, legal resources, compliance, sometimes marketing, sometimes software engineering. Um, there's a group in New York called Redesign Health that we like to work with. They're um, a big player in this space. And it's, it's really fun because you have uh, now... A kind of a management tier of healthcare executives who have deep experience in the space, lots of connections who can help point you in the right direction, make introductions. I think that there's an emerging trend of these venture studios in healthcare, which uh, I think it's a great trend. It, it's a great opportunity for startups to to take away some of the risk that comes with that first one or two years of feeling like you're in outer space and you don't know which direction you're supposed to go. It's good. Thank you for those references, and I think this, this can be helpful to a lot of people. And uh, you know, before before I go over the time you made available for this, uh, any last remarks you might like to add, and then you know we could close uh, with the MedBloom uh, description and call to action for people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I think that I I initially was very skeptical of going into healthcare as a as a career path, and uh, to be honest, I've had a, a a bit of a love hate relationship with it over time because it can feel very slow and frustrating and sometimes very stifling. But over time, I've grown quite comfortable with it. Um, and I now really appreciate it for the opportunity that exists. Um, I think that it, it's worth uh, being patient in, in healthcare. It, it can feel slow. Um, and it, it, can, it can feel overregulated from time to time, but if you're willing to be patient and, and persist and make the investment in it, there's so much interesting opportunity and there's so much demand for people who understand the, the space for what it is and and who have made the investment in like who are the key players? What are the key challenges? How do I navigate the system? How do I get things done in this very complex system? Um, there, it, it, it's been a great um place for my career. And so I'm very happy and I encourage others to do it as well. Um, with regards to MedPlum, uh, if you are launching a new digital healthcare product or you have an existing digital healthcare product and you want to start thinking more about security or compliance or interoperability or how to just accelerate your overall healthcare software development, I think I, I recommend you take a look at MedPlum. We have a lot of great features, great capabilities. Um, lots of documentation, example repos, how to get started, how to move fast. Um, if you're not playing in healthcare, but you're a, a um, technology enthusiast, please just go over to our GitHub repo and give us a star. Like anything that helps us um, get more visibility, um, helps uh, improve our reach and gets more access and more viability to these large organizations. And we just want to keep making progress and keep doing whatever we can do to promote uh, more innovation in healthcare. That was incredible. That was perfect. Cody, thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. And I hope we can do this again in the future. Thank of you course. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers.